encourage you to try to memorize all the concepts. It's not to memorize the terms and the definitions. Rather, it's to try to understand the different, there are different ways the different peoples go about regulating behavior. There is no one way that is necessary and no one way that is inherently superior to another. We can take different approaches and societies have historically taken different approaches and even today they take different approaches. So this is an important lesson, it's an important lesson to keep in mind because we have a natural tendency to regard our ways of doing things as normal and other ways of doing things, <coughs> foreign ways of doing things, as abnormal. Tikanga is not simply a legal system. It goes beyond that, a complete worldview. But contained within that worldview are or is a legal system. A legal system that exhibits both positivist and natural law elements. In the positivist angle, we see that within Tikanga, we have a code of conduct. And this code of conduct sets out certain rules of behavior that people are meant to adhere to or abide by. Now, now we also have a spiritual compass. And what this spiritual compass does is express certain morals, a kind of shared morality among Maori. But be aware that the code of conduct is regarded as subordinate to the spiritual compass. So we have tikanga, and we have tikanga that will vary from place to place, right, across Aotearoa. However, there are certain foundations that are common to the whole. Tikanga is based on collectivism. Now, the rights of the individual are intertwined with their relationship with the community. What Faka Papa does, from a legal perspective, is emphasize the bonds between peoples, between individuals and ancestors, between generations. And it emphasizes the bond between all living things, roughly the prestige or authority of an individual. Now, mana can be inherited, prestige, it can be inherited. But mana is also something that one can acquire. Be aware that I wrote individual there because I want you thinking about people, but also that mana applies to more than just sentient beings. So nature has mana, trees, rocks, water, all of these have mana as well. Sacredness. People or objects or places can be tapu, they can be sacred. And it is the responsibility of everyone to preserve their tapu and to respect the tapu of others. Everyone is subject to tikanga. From a tikanga perspective, everyone is subject to tikanga. And the actions of the individual will necessarily affect everyone else. As we said, tikanga is a complete worldview that is based on notions of collectivism. What this translates to is that a harm that is committed by one person is in fact committed by their fanau. Meaning that not only does that person have a responsibility to redress the harm that was committed, but so does the whole of the fanau. The responsibility is shared. Within tikanga, Remedies are restorative in nature. What we're trying to do with the Tikanga is to restore balance. The first one is known as Muru, which is satisfaction by redress. The offender and their fanau, and the victim and their fanau, will acknowledge that a harm was committed, and they agree for some form of compensation. So there isn't some kind of external code by which we sit down and say, you've done the following, here is the prescribed redress. We sit down, discuss it, and decide what's the appropriate remedy. 
idea here, once again, is the restoration of balance. Now, what Muru does is help achieve Utu. What Utu represents is a kind of reciprocation of deeds. It's a reciprocation of deeds intended to facilitate balance. Now, Rahui is the prohibition of certain activities for a period of time, a prescribed period of time. The final one is Tapu, which is different from sacredness, be aware. It's about setting apart, making something or someone tapu is meant to protect that thing from interference. It's meant to protect that thing from overuse. What it also does is protect people from the dangers that that tapu may pose. We have these different principles because the way Maori relate to the world differs on some levels to the way non-Maori relate to the world. One system is based on formal rules, and the other one is not. In Tikanga, you don't have, there are certain behaviors that are expected, but there isn't this external code, nor is there this formal authority that imposes particular rules of behavior, rules of conduct, upon everyone. The so Maori law, was regarded as not law because it didn't resemble the English system, when in fact it was law, just a form of law that was substantially different from the English model. Another important difference, collectivism versus individualism. In Western legal theory, we're very much concerned with the individual and their responsibility for their actions. By contrast, Tikanga will focus on the community. Responsibility for redress is shared by the whole of the fana. Theories of punishment. So you have retributive justice, you have restorative justice within the Tikanga system, and you also have reformative justice. <coughs> Western laws can be retributive. You're punishing the person for the act they've committed. If one is operating from a retributive mindset, and then maybe restorative doesn't make so much sense. Because it's not about balance, it's more about punishment. If one is thinking from a reformative perspective, then maybe retributive doesn't make so much sense. Because sending someone to jail for 10 or 15 years is going to essentially turn that person into a career criminal. How did the British handle these differences? Efforts were made to essentially eradicate Maori traditional beliefs. What we're seeing is that a patronizing attitude was adopted by the English towards Maori. And this has historical roots. We already said this before with white man's burden. 